what do you think about the economic impact of the Russian Ukraine war on India and Tamil Nadu? Such a big disruption in the global kind of fabric. See, we are much more integrated global economy than we used to be, let's even say 10 years ago. Of course, the, the China problems and the COVID changed it to some extent. But we were already in a situation where much of the inflation we were seeing was driven by supply side shocks rather than excess demand, at least in countries like India. So, of course, the biggest concern is we have this kind of disruption. Uh, even at the level it is now, it is going to create further shocks in the system, in supply chains, in access, and therefore create bottlenecks, inflation, etc. It could get a lot worse from now. So I think that's uh, the kind of real fear. Now, whenever events like this happen, in some ways it will affect Tamil Nadu more because it's more integrated to the global economy than the average. In some other ways, it will affect us less because our infrastructure and our spending on social welfare and on uh, basic programs is high. And so, at least the poor won't feel it that much. The, the aggregate will feel it, but the bottom will not feel it that much. Uh, so everyone fears a sharp spike in the fuel prices. So do you think there is any wisdom in such a hike? If yes, why? Well, I, I, you know, it's hard for me to read other people's minds. But I would say that given the track record of the last seven years, they have pretty much consistently moved the prices up every time crude oil uh, went up. And they have almost always moved the taxes up when crude oil went down. And of course, that was always going to lead to this one dangerous outcome, which I mentioned in the Tamil Nadu Assembly in 2018 or 19 in my speech. I said, if you keep on raising the taxes this way, because you're benefiting from dropping crude, what happens when crude goes back to 100? That's the exact, word I, uh, exact line I used. What happens when crude goes back to 100? Will you sell petrol at the pump at 120, 125? So it'll be interesting to see how much, I think, if you look at the UPA government, uh, both in Delhi and in Tamil Nadu, the governments absorbed the shock of much of the oil price increase. You can remember it went up to 120, 130. And at that time, uh, the oil marketing companies were suffering huge losses and the government was writing some subsidies in, in Delhi. And in Tamil Nadu, we cut the VAT two or three times. But now I think, uh, you know, the union government has boxed itself into a corner because most of its taxes come from indirect taxes. It's greatly cut the direct taxation, which is much more fair because it's progressive. And has boxed itself because so much of those indirect taxes come from energy products. And so it's going to find itself in a difficult place because if it doesn't do something, I mean, it did a 10 rupee cut allegedly for the elections. Let's see what happens. I think the next couple of weeks, as well, the next three days will be very interesting. Do so you have any suggestions for Finance Minister Nirmala? Uh, who am I? I can't even manage mine well. Who am I to tell the Union Finance Minister what to do? I'm assuming she knows her job well. Yeah. So you're from Madura. It's yeah. a place of uh, lip-smacking food. Do you, are you a foodie? And what of course, of course. Yeah, I, I didn't really spend much time in Madura, actually. I went away to boarding school at the age of five, and I spent much of my life uh, either in boarding school or out of the country. But uh, I spent two years for plus two in Madurai. And in those two years, I, I really learned to enjoy the street food. Uh, in many cases, uh, my favorite shop, which I still go to, is the one where the Majora Coats mill workers used to come out of the shift and eat. So we used to time our uh, exits from school to beat the rush from the factories. So yeah, I'm a big, big fan of street food. And I, I still, as a minister, I still go every so often and sit. It happens to be in my constituency, which makes it easy. Yeah. Biggest influences in your life? Uh, of course, my father, my grandfather, my lineage, because I think the urge to contribute to some greater good rather than just personal development. I had a lot of influential teachers who changed my way of thinking. I was blessed, I think, uh, to be exposed to a lot of things. Uh, events. I was at the Twin Trade, I mean, at the Twin Towers when the World Trade Center, when the attack happened on September 11th. I was at Lehman Brothers when it went bankrupt. So such seismic events kind of tell you something about the nature of life. It's very ephemeral. Nothing is really that solid or structural. And so you learn to kind of focus on what's really important, which is human relationships and values and everything else comes and goes, and nothing, you know, nothing is stable. 
you can't take anything for granted. So I think those influenced my way of life quite a bit. Yeah. So, uh, do you listen to music? What is your favorite song? <laughs> I listen to a lot of music actually, it calms me a lot and I don't know about favorite song but uh, I grew up in an era where I think, uh, you know, the classic kind of rock and roll of the US was uh, what we all kind of heard in school and in college so I still, I have music apps on all my phones and I'm subscribed to all the services and I have headphones in my pocket so whenever I get on flights or long distances. Do you listen. also sing? Oh, no, not at all. No, I, zero talent. Absolutely <coughs> none. What do you think about this conclave, sir? Your views on Think Radio? Yeah, I think the second time I'm coming, you know, obviously it's important to have discussions about uh, what is the building block of all development, which is education. So I think, uh, I'm sure, you know, I, I, I only saw in the paper the range of speakers. I know um, Rajiv Gowder, my friend, was here earlier. We were supposed to meet but couldn't meet. I know Sashita Roor was here. I know other people who were supposed to come but couldn't make it. So I think you have such a, a eclectic group of people. So I think it's good to have a diversity of views, right? That's how we learn from each other and we uh, stimulate debate. So one last question, your tips for the youngsters. What would you like to tell them? I think be yourself. Try to find who you are. I think a lot of the journey for most of us is internal. Who am I? What do I want? What do I stand for? What makes me happy? What am I good at? And, uh, you know, avoid trying to be like others or comparing yourself to others. Everybody's path is unique. Everybody's life is different. I can look back at my life and find half a dozen times when I should have done or could have done something different that would have taken me in a different trajectory. Equally, I can look back at a few places and say, thank God I was smart enough not to do that. That would have taken me in a very bad place. So life is unpredictable. The, the skill is setting your own path. That's the real, you know, kind of trick is never compare yourself to anybody else. Never benchmark yourself on other people's performance or achievements or outcomes. If you want to be rich, because it makes you happy, not because you want to be richer than somebody else, right? So I think that's, that would be my advice, just be yourself, be an individual. The more unique you are, the more likely that you'll be happy and you'll add some unique value to the world. Yeah? Thank, Thank you. you.